Hi, I'm Matthew Schumar, and I am the program coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Uh, prior to my role with OBCI, I was the coordinator and co-author for the second atlas of breeding birds in Ohio. This was a large citizen science project where almost a thousand Ohioans volunteered their time to survey birds for six years all across the state and they amassed a database of over a million breeding bird observations. And so uh, this is an incredibly valuable resource that um, researchers have been analyzing to see how bird populations have changed over the last 25 years and how our impacts to the landscape may have um, affected some of those changes. We've uh, pulled and summarized all of that work into a volume that was published last year the second atlas of breeding birds in Ohio. Um, so I am one of five uh, co-editors on that project. Um, Paul Rodewald was the director of the project. He is now the senior editor of the Birds of North America at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and we had other folks uh, from the Division of Wildlife um, and various um, institutions all around Ohio working on this project. Um, you can get it at any major online retailer and in bookstores all around. It was published by Penn State University Press. Well, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the importance of waterways um, in Ohio and, and really throughout the world. And um, on that subject, um, I've shown here the cover of the second atlas of breeding birds in Ohio. And the species that we chose for the cover is the northern perula. Um, and we chose that species because it has seen such dramatic change um, in its population in the state over the last 25 years. And much of that um, is related to changes in, uh, as a result from the Clean Air Act. Um, this is a species that is now nesting um, very abundantly in deciduous riparian areas. Um, so it's using those large sycamore trees over forested streams and rivers. Um, and one thing of note, uh, this species uses lichens in nest construction throughout much of its breeding range and improvements in clean air and water quality have really allowed those lichens to uh, flourish in Ohio um, and throughout the Northeast. Um, this species used to only exclusively nest in uh, coniferous forest in Ohio, but is now um, using deciduous areas quite frequently. Some of that I think is due to lichen health, some of that may be some um, behavioral changes and some other changes as well. Increase in arthropod uh, diversity and abundance in these um, stream systems. Um, so a lot, a lot of fascinating things from the Northern Perula um, and we are really excited to see uh, that species expand from where it only occurred in the uh, very southern portion of the state, now um, nesting here in the Cleveland area as well. Yeah, so there, there were many changes um, that have occurred, not only in the last 25 years, but over the last 150 or more years um, that we've documented in Ohio. Ohio has a really rich um, ornithological history. Um, lots of fantastic naturalists and scientists uh, really did um, some amazing work during the mid to late 1800s. Um, Kirtland and Wheaton uh, were some of the, the most uh, prolific uh, naturalists in the state. Um, but following it up through the 1900s, Jones and Dawson and there are these fantastic publications um, really documenting uh, the natural world and particularly um, the avian world um, in Ohio. And um, it was a lot of fun working on the Atlas to go back and explore some of those early works to see not only how things have changed, but how we have interacted with these species to cause some of those changes. At one point in history, uh, for instance, Buick's wren was considered the wren of Ohio. It was uh, the most abundant wren species in the state and is now extirpated from Ohio and, and much of the eastern United States. Um, that is a species that underwent this sort of uh, boom and bust cycle when settlers came to Ohio and cleared all the forests. It really allowed that species to spread from western states and became quite common throughout Appalachia and in the Midwest. And then as forests um, started to grow back, um, it, it, it really started to recede out of Ohio and, and saw a lot of competition from Carolina wren and house wren. And so changes like that, that um, you know, we don't 
we don't uh, experience today, but you know the, the the massive change that has occurred because of land use um, change over the last 150 years has really changed um, the natural world around us in ways that, that we may not fully realize. Some for the better and, and some for the worse. Um, there have been lots of exciting changes. Tree swallow is another species that many people may take for granted today. At one point it was fairly rare and uncommon in Ohio, um, but as we built dams and reservoirs for recreation and water use around the state of Ohio, um, that allowed a lot of foraging and nesting opportunities. And particularly starting in the 1950s when um, nest box programs became um, very popular, that's when tree swallow populations really started to flourish um, throughout Ohio and, and much of the surrounding states. Um, so many of these changes um, we, we haven't even realized may have occurred um, because we're, we're so focused on what may be happening now. Um, but many of these changes can inform uh, practices that we may uh, undertake to um, mitigate future change as well. The concept of a breeding bird atlas originated in Europe, actually, um, uh, in the UK with an atlas for flora and fauna. And uh, the UK did their first national breeding bird atlas in the 1970s. Um, we started doing uh, breeding bird atlas projects here in North America shortly thereafter. Uh, I believe Massachusetts was the first state in 1974 mm -hmm. to undertake a breeding bird atlas. These are uh, very large and uh, resource uh, hungry projects. Um, they take many years of planning uh, and are, can be expensive projects as well. Some of that we try to reduce as much as possible by, by doing this as a citizen science project. So we had almost a thousand volunteers in Ohio um, contributing to the project as well. Um, but they're very large. Um, they take a lot of planning in terms of how to collect the data, how to analyze it, etc. cetera. Um, and in North America, I believe there have been 42 to 44 states and provinces that have undertaken at least one breeding bird atlas. In Ohio, we've done two. Um, we did one in the early 1980s and then one from 2006 to 2011. And those second generation atlas projects are incredibly important, I would say, much more even than the first one because it allows us to look at the changes that have occurred um, over these longer time periods. And long-term data sets are hard to come by but are incredibly important. Um, it's hard to really assess important biological questions with um, a single year or you know, a few weeks worth of data. Really what we need is um, data collected um, in the same way over years and um, an atlas project is one way to do that. There are other projects like the breeding bird survey um, that have been conducted since um, early to mid 1960s. And the Christmas bird count is another fantastic one which has, has been ongoing for more than a hundred years um, and has really allowed us to look to see at how distributions and populations have changed over time. So there are, there are a number of conservation issues um, that occur today that, that we're very aware of. Um, things like land use change and climate change. Um, and by collecting these data, we were able to address uh, the impacts of some of those. Some surprises, um, some things um, changed in ways that we weren't necessarily expecting. Um, and it allows uh, a deeper insight to ask um, a different question, perhaps. We assume, um, so here in Ohio we have two chickadee species um, that occur in an interface um, just, just north of, of mid-state, um, Carolina chickadee, which breeds in southern states, and the black-capped chickadee, uh, which nests here in the Cleveland area, um, and in northeastern states and in Canada as well. And there, there's been a lot of research into how that um, hybrid interface or that distribution line may be changing with climate change. Um, and there's been research done in Pennsylvania, um, in Philadelphia area, uh, looking at how they've shown that that, that distribution line has shifted. Both black capped chickadees and Carolina chickadees are shifting their distributions northward. Um, but when you're working in, across a landscape that changes dramatically in terms of uh, topographic uh, position, you know, we, we, we're 
we're crossing the Appalachian Mountains and then coming into Midwestern states here. Um, there's a lot of topographic change and the species themselves interact in ways that we're not exactly sure. Carolina chickadee is um, sort of the dominant species socially uh, of the two and so when we look at things like habitat change, how the species themselves interact with each other, how changes in climate may occur across a, an elevational gradient, um, it, it muddies up the picture somewhat. And with the second atlas data in Ohio, we have seen that both uh, Carolina and black cap chickadees are moving north in western Ohio but that doesn't appear to be occurring in eastern Ohio. Um, Carolina chickadees are perhaps moving slightly north, but black cap chickadees appear to be expanding south in that area. And so we have a larger area of overlap. And so this is interesting. There's been a lot of land use change in northeastern Ohio over the last 50 to 100 years. And so seeing how those changes may inform some of the behavioral changes and the distributional changes. So there were some things that surprised us. Um, there are a lot of issues that we know are issues. So things like uh, land use change and particularly how we're managing our forests as well as changes in climate that have occurred.